Topologies. When planning and installing the physical LAN, you need to take into account what type of topology to use. A topology is the way that computers are wired together. It's usually displayed in diagram format. And there are four main types of topologies, the bus, ring, star, and mesh. But hands down, the most common of these is the star topology. When a star topology is used, all computers are wired to a central connecting device, usually with twisted pair cabling. This device could be a hub, an MSAO, a switch, or a SOHO router. Bus topology. You'll rarely see this setup, and when you take a look at the figure, it's easy to understand why. Notice that all the computers are connected to a backbone not a central connecting device like a hub. This means that if you wanted to add or remove computers from a bus network, you would have to take the whole network down first. You'll also note that coaxial cable is normally used in a bus topology. This type of cable is limited in speed and really can't handle today's network's data throughput. Ring topology. This is another uncommon type of topology which also uses coaxial cable with no central connecting device, as shown in the figure. Notice the ancient looking computers in the illustration. That's how old the ring topology is. Now I'm just kidding. That's just my illustration for a computer or a PC. But a ring topology is created by connecting both ends of the bus topology together, forming that ring, as the name implies, a ring of computers. The physical ring, like the bus, is limited in speed and by the fact that if you want to add or remove computers, you'll have to bring the whole network down first in order to do so. In addition to the ring topology shown in the figure, there are other types of uh, ring topologies, including logical ring setups like token ring and configurations like FDDI. The mesh topology. Mesh is a completely different type of topology from bus and ring. In a mesh setup, every device connects to every other device. As shown in the figure, this can involve a lot of connections, a lot of wiring. The number of network connections that each computer would need is the total number of computers in the network minus one. As you can guess, this topology is extremely rare but some special labs and think tanks may use it. A lesser version of this topology is the partial mesh. This is where only a few of the computers on the network have secondary network connections to other systems. You may see this with, say, database replication. Let's say this was our primary database and this was our secondary database. When doing database replication, we may want a dedicated wired connection between those servers. This will facilitate fast transmission of the database from one system to another. And these computers at that point would then be known as multi-homed systems because they'd have more than one connection. Next, and this is a very common version of STAR, is known as the STAR bus. In some cases, you may need to connect two STAR networks to each other. If this is the case, then the easiest way to do it is to connect the two central connecting devices to each other, the hub in one LAN to the hub in the other LAN. And that'll give you your STAR bus topology. You're effectively creating a bus between the two STARs. Take this to the next level and you get the hierarchical star. Use one central hub or switch as a backbone and then connect several hubs directly to that switch, each with its own star topology. Now you have the hierarchical star topology. This is extremely common in large corporate networks. I urge you to do a Google search for star 
and hierarchical star and go through the images and diagrams that you might see from some various companies and individuals that have uh, put up that information. Connectors. There are several types of connectors that you should be able to identify for the exam. The RJ45 plug. Actually, the proper name for this is 8P8C, or 8 position, 8 contact. But RJ45 is used by almost everyone. We've shown how to use these when making patch cables and permanent connections to patch panels. The port on a patch panel is also known as a socket. And the plug may also be referred to as a connector. RJ11 connectors. These are used for telephony applications. The cable that connects your phone to the jack will have RJ11 plugs on both ends, like the plug shown in the figure. RJ11 connectors are capable of handling six wires, but normally there are only four. This connector would use what's known as GERBY, G-R-B-Y, and this GERBY setup specifies that the color of the wires are green, red, black, and yellow. If you were to look at the plugs on that telephone cable with the tab facing away from you, you'd see that one end is set as B and the other end is set in the opposite way. When connecting to screw terminals or a punch block, however, the order is the original GERBY, G-R-B-Y. F-type connectors. These are used for cable TV and cable internet connections, as well as for satellite TV or internet. They are screw-on connectors, and the most common of these is the RG6. Here we have the standard RG6 connector. Here we have an RG6 terminator. Let's say you install a splitter. Any line that's not being used on the splitter should have a terminator put on it. And here we have a coupler. Let's say you wanted to make the RG6 line longer. You could add a coupler on, or you could connect two cables with a coupler. Not always recommended, but it's a, a possible solution. Fiber connectors. There are several types of fiber connectors, including ST, as shown here. The ST connector employs a rugged uh, metal bayonet coupling ring with radial ramps that facilitate engagement to the studs of the mating adapter. Two ST connectors are available for jacketed fiber, one with a beige boot and one with a black boot. The two colors enable easy identification of the fibers when terminating individual connections to form a duplex jumper. Other common fiber connectors include SC and fiber LC. USB. USB, as I'm sure you all know, stands for Universal Serial Bus and is a mainstay in today's computers. Uh, it's used for cameras, printers, scanners, and even networking to a certain extent. A computer can handle anywhere from 1 to 127 devices on the USB or on that bus. Though a USB hub would be needed to go beyond two or four devices because most computers only have two or four USB interfaces. Let's talk USB speeds. USB version 1, the original, at full speed ran at 12 megabits per second. However, most computers that have been built in the past five years and any computers that are being built now are USB 2.0 compliant, USB 2.0 high speed, which runs at 480 megabits per second. They also have uh, something in the works, super speed 3.0. 5 gigabits per second, and that's uh, 625 megabytes per second. So watch out for super speed in 2009-2010. Next is IEEE 1394. The IEEE 1394 interface, um, also known as FireWire, as originally created by Apple, is more commonly associated with the attachment of peripheral devices, such as digital cameras, or printers or music devices than it is with network connections. However, it is possible to create small networks with IEEE 1394 cables. The IEEE 1394 interface comes in a 4, a 6, 
or a nine pin version. And we're showing uh, a cable with two ends, each of which is our six pin connections. Let's talk uh, IEEE 1394 speeds. Firewire 400 or IEEE 1394 400 runs at 400 megabits per second. And it can use the six or the four pin version of the cable. Firewire 800 runs at 800 megabits per second, and that utilizes the newer 9-pin version of the cable. And we have some uh, newer technologies coming out, S1600 and S3200, and uh, these run at 1.6 and 3.2 gigabits per second, respectively, and they both use the 9-pin. Now, for more information on connectors and more pictures on connectors, uh, look to uh, www.davidlprouse.com slash labs slash connectors. Virtual local area networks or VLANs are an alternative way of connecting or segmenting your network without the need for routers. VLANs are the way of the present and the future. VLANs can limit broadcasts and collisions. They can increase security organize your network, and bring up performance. The VLAN rests on one device as its foundation. It might be a switch, a Cisco PIX device, a multi-homed server, or other device. Regardless of what you use, this device must have multiple network connections. A scenario that could use VLANs would be the following. A school with three computer classrooms, say 20 computers each, and 10 computers for office staff scattered around the building, plus a library. You really wouldn't want the students from each classroom to be able to see each other, nor would you want any of the students to have access to the office network. The library should be kept separate as well. You could do this by creating VLANs. Here's one variation of a port-based VLAN. In this same scenario, what you could do is install a VLAN-ready switch and assign a different network number for each port. For example, port 1 would be 192.168.1.0, port 2 would be 192.168.2.0, and so on. Then you connect a separate hub or switch, if you like, to each of those ports. This will create a hierarchical star topology. Cables must be connected to their corresponding hub and room. For instance, the cable connections coming from classroom 1 will connect to the classroom 1 hub, which will then be connected to the 192.168.1 port on the VLAN switch. So you get the idea. In this way, you can have total separation of your network without the use of a router. The ultimate beauty of this is that there may be staff connections all over the building that all lead to the same section of the VLAN. For example, admins have connections in a technical room. Instructors need connections from every classroom. And other staff may be scattered around the rest of the office. The cables that come into the server room for each of these staff connections can be connected to the staff hub, which in turn connects to the staff port on the VLAN switch. So again, this is known as a port-based VLAN. Keep in mind that you can assign a VLAN to any port of the VLAN switch, but you should plan it first and make it organized. There are three main types of VLANs, protocol-based VLANs, in this case, you would have a different protocol running on the various computers and or ports that you wanted to separate. It could be that you have a server with two network interface cards, each of which runs a different protocol. The aforementioned port-based VLANs, as explained previously, these are the most common. If a computer needs to be um, moved to another area of the office, then you would have to repatch that system in the server room to keep it on the same VLAN. This is not that time consuming and is the default option for uh, most administrators. And we also have MAC addressed, uh, MAC address based VLANs. In this case, a switch will keep track of all the MAC addresses on the entire network. 
and you would have to specify which belong to each portion of the VLAN. This is time consuming at first, but a benefit is that a computer can be moved anywhere in the office without requiring anything to be reconfigured and the system will still be on the same VLAN. So a little tricky stuff there. It all depends on really what the needs of your office are. All right, let's wrap up lab eight. In this lab, we identified the various network topologies like star, ring, bus, mesh, star bus, and hierarchical star. We described several types of networking connectors that you'll be using. And we showed how a VLAN works and described the three main types of VLANs. Up next is lab nine, using a multifunction device.